Perfect GPA, exceptional MCAT, and extensive leadership as a manager at a healthcare consulting firm. And you have the recipe for, well, the worst pre-med I have ever seen. And this had nothing to do with his grades, his resume, his letters of recommendations, or his personal statement. His primary issue was his inability to work in teams, and it was such a rip-roaring red flag that multiple surgeons and residents had commented on it. And you can imagine what it was really said behind closed doors when admissions committees discussed his candidacy. Today, we'll learn exactly what he did to rub everyone the wrong way, the importance of teamwork in modern medicine, and the unwritten rules that one has to know when working in a healthcare setting that I learned after making mistake after mistake after mistake. This is a pre-med student that I met when I was doing an away rotation in orthopedic surgery on the East Coast. We'll call him Jerry. And Jerry had the fantastic opportunity to shadow some of the most elite physicians and surgeons in that program. And there were many things that Jerry did that just drove everyone crazy. For example, Jerry would ask questions at inappropriate times. When we were rounding on patients and seeing what their wounds looked like, Jerry would ask questions in front of the patients themselves. Jerry also flat out told patients the wrong instructions. I think that he wanted to assume a larger responsibility and was sharing instructions on how to deal with wounds and schedule appointments, things that he had never done before in this clinic. And worse yet, when Jerry was in the operating room, he would grab instruments off of the tray and hand them preemptively to the residents and the surgeon, which were all the wrong instruments needed at that time of the operation. These things just drove multiple surgeons and residents crazy. They weren't able to focus during the case, which was not only distracting, but dangerous for the patient on the table. And even after having multiple sessions of constructive criticism to tell Jerry that sometimes less is more, just observing and enjoying and learning through passive observation was enough at his level of training, he did not improve and continue to make the same mistakes again and again. And this led to some pretty bad outcomes. He was sent home early on many shadowing occasions. He never earned a letter of recommendation. And every attending and residence that worked with him never wanted to again. This essentially erases his chances at being a medical student at that elite institution. And so we'll talk about some of the unspoken rules that come with being a new member on a team in a hospital. In fact, this is so important that many admissions committee members have said that when they interview pre-med students, one filter that they use is, can I imagine being on call with this person or spending a 12 hour night shift with this person by my side. Having strong letters of recommendations that can speak to how well you work in teams and can speak to your reliability and dependability are a good convincing way to show medical schools that you pass that test. Perhaps one of the most frustrating things, but true unspoken rules about medicine is that there exists a hierarchy of training, pre-meds, medical students, interns, residents, chiefs, fellows, junior attendings, senior attendings, and the chair. There is always one person more senior than you. And even if you feel like you can do the job with your experience and your understanding, sometimes it's not appropriate to go ahead and be proactive. Even if you know the next instrument is a retractor, taking it off the table and giving it to the resident before they asked for it can be seen as being a little bit too proactive. Working in teams is all about understanding the role that you play. And as a pre-med, med student, and even intern, the best thing that you can do is honestly the safest thing for the patient. Sometimes it's taking a step back, doing less, and only acting when someone more senior than you tells you exactly what to do and when to do it. Your responsibilities will naturally grow over time and you will become more intentional and more proactive with some of the safer things to do that you've done again and again and again. But until then, please, please, please do not overstep your bounds. Not only is it dangerous, it's honestly not looked upon well in many, many ways medical contexts. So if being able to work on teams is so important in medicine, how do you as a pre-med demonstrate you're good at it? 
Here are two examples straight from my own personal statement and my own most meaningful section that demonstrate this value of teamwork for myself. All right, so let's talk about teamwork in this context as the finance director of Vietnamese Community Health. I just wanna point your attention to these couple of sentences here. At our last health fair, the average annual income of our 150 patients was $10,000 to $30,000, 37% had no insurance, 48% spoke little to no English, 60% at risk for hypertension, 10% showed diabetic sugar levels. This is all data that I did not personally collect. This was our health fair coordinator, our president, our volunteer coordinator. Those were the staff members whose projects were able to get us this data so that we could better understand our patient population. And you'll see here what my role was, was to apply for 12 funding bodies earning $20,386.08. In addition to that $20,386.08, I tracked how we spent our money so we could understand what it took to service our patient population. Anytime you are working towards a big project or a big goal like Vietnamese Community Health was, you will need to work with many other teams team members. In this case, our health fair coordinators could not purchase their supplies until we, my co-finance director and I, were able to apply for those funding bodies, able to make a pitch to our funding panels and actually get that money and get that approval in hand so that we could rent the venue, we could buy the cholesterol machines, we could rent the dentists and optometrists and chiropractors and invite all of our speakers and guest physicians who were helping service our community. I was a part, a cog in the overall machine that was Vietnamese Community Health. And this is one example of me working in a team-based environment. This is our second example. And while it's not as straightforward, I do think there is a point to be made about showing how other parts of your life, the non-medical school stuff, can also demonstrate key character traits that are important for modern physicians. Basketball and my teammates composed core parts of my identity. I missed making swing passes to my friend in the corner and throwing up my three fingers to signal the inevitable swish through the nylon net. So whether it's basketball or a community health fair club or any other team-based environments that you've been a part of, demonstrating that you understand how to take the perspective of your president or empathize with the perspective of your teammates or understand what it's like to be a coach or the star player of a team or the 12th man on the bench, those are key characteristics for people who understand how to work and how to be effective in team-based environments. And what's more, it does does not have to be directly related to medical school. Being a great team member really boils down to two things. One is being an excellent team member, and two is having the empathy to understand another person's perspective, wants, fears, and desires. That's how the anesthesiologist understands how scared the patient in front of him or her is right before their surgery. And that's how the orthopedic surgery chief resident can readjust the light, knowing that the attending will need a different view on whatever he or she is operating on. If you can understand someone else's experience better than they can, then you can predict and understand what they will do and what they will need next. And the only way to start developing that muscle is to put yourself in more team-based situations and throw your ego out the door. Be able to take on any role, no matter how small. I am currently an anesthesiology doctor, and in our program, we rotate with the head and neck surgeons, the otolaryngologists. And my role there has nothing to do with anesthesiology, medicine, really. All I do is update an Excel sheet. And honestly, this Excel sheet can be updated by someone with basic high school computer skills. For many people, that abrupt sink down to the bottom of the totem pole feels terrible. And honestly, it doesn't feel great for me on many days, but I understand that this Excel sheet is integral to the larger mission of taking care of our head and neck patients. And so I do it every day. I do it well, I learn what I can from it, and I try to be the best at updating that Excel sheet and giving those head and neck surgeons what they need to succeed. That is an example of getting rid of your ego in the context of the larger mission.
And if building teamwork is important to you, I will leave you with two recommendations. The first is a book. It's Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's a very simple, straightforward read that talks about how relationships are built and grown over time. And of course, nothing you read in there will be life-changing things that you have never thought of before. But I challenge you to execute on the principles of the book, whether it's calling someone by their name every single time, or smiling every single time, or reaching out to them consistently every single week, asking about what they care about, asking if you can help in any way. Those are the principles that need to be executed masterfully in order to build strong relationships, in order to be an effective team member. And second is a huge mindset shift that opened up my entire understanding of teams. And it's the thought that your personality is not fixed, it is not static. It is something that can change and grow over time. Just like organic chemistry or the weight room, these are things that you can work at every single day of your life to improve, better, and change. If you can separate yourself from the label of introvert or extrovert, or the thought that you're just born naturally socially awkward, then you can start focusing on doing the small things, the names, the smiles, the eye contact, that really can change your personality and how other people see you in this world. If you liked this video, you'll love this next video here with a 3.96 GPA, 517 MCAT, who was rejected from 37 medical schools. We break down every single part of her primary application so you know exactly what went wrong. You do not want to be the pre-med who misses one red flag and gets rejected to every medical school they apply to. It takes at least four years to build a competitive pre-med application and four seconds to completely ruin it. It takes four years to build a competitive pre-med application and it takes an ad comm four seconds to send a gut-wrenching rejection letter. Thank you for your time today. Hopefully you also appreciate the importance of being able to truly work in teams and I will see you in the next one.